We've discussed the cognitive interventions and the behavioral interventions, and in this next section, we're going to talk about the mindfulness interventions. So in section five, we're going to discuss mindfulness and more. We're going to discuss mindfulness interventions. We'll talk about what is mindfulness, the three-minute mindfulness intervention, the five-minute twice-a-day practice, the informal practice, and then we'll talk about some clinical complications and what to do if the intervention didn't work. We'll talk about daily self-care for patients and also psycho-emotional concepts for all patients. I'd like to discuss mindfulness now. And before I show you how you can use mindfulness interventions with your patients, I'd like to discuss what is mindfulness. Mindfulness has been described as a moment-to-moment, non-judgmental awareness cultivated by paying attention. John Kabat-Zinn said that, and he is one of the leaders in using mindfulness skills with medical patients. If you think about it, we're very rarely in the present moment. We're usually thinking about something that happened or didn't happen, or we're usually in the future, planning, worrying, thinking about something we need to do or something we, you know, could have done or that's kind of going back to the past, but sort of anticipating future problems. And the problem is we're very rarely here, here like right this second in this very moment. And so mindfulness is essentially training your brain to be in the present moment not five minutes ago and not five minutes from now, not in the past thinking about all the problems and all the bad things that have happened and not in the future getting anxious about what's going to happen, but being right here, right now. Because the truth is, is that when you're right here, right now, it's usually okay. People tend to get into trouble and tend to suffer because they're not really here. So it sounds very simple. And it's simple, but it's definitely not easy. So with mindfulness, what you realize when you start sort of being right here, right now, is you realize that thoughts sort of come and that thoughts go. And that feelings or emotional states come and they go. So sometimes when you have a patient and they say, I'm so angry, I'm just angry all the time and I can't stop being angry, and then you talk to them five minutes later and they're a little less angry. When you're mindful, you realize the differences, the nuances in the feeling states, and you recognize that sometimes you will have a thought, I can't go on, I can't do this, but a couple minutes later, you're not having that thought anymore. So you start to recognize that thoughts come and go, and feelings come and go, and there's an appreciation for the fleeting nature of things. So when you do that, you create a certain amount of space between your thoughts and between your emotions. Because if you have an upsetting negative thought, you know that it's going to pass. If you have an upsetting or uncomfortable uncomfortable emotion, you know that it's going to pass. So you don't take it as seriously. Remember when we were talking about cognitive, cognitive interventions, we discussed that thoughts aren't facts? With the cognitive interventions, what you're trying to do is you're trying to actually change the thought. With mindfulness, a mindful approach would be to sort of let the thought come, let the thought come and let the thought go. You're basically just letting it come and go. You're not judging it, and you're not really clinging onto it or attaching it. That's one of the differences. And you're recognizing that, you know, we all have a lot of thoughts and it's just chatter. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. So how do you teach your patients to sort of be mindful and to be in the present moment? Before we get to the specific interventions, I want to just tell you one other thing, one important component of mindfulness, and that is Whenever you want to come back to the present moment, you can always go back to your breath. That with mindfulness, the breath is the anchor. Because until you die, you're always going to be breathing. So with patients, if they ever need to come back to the present moment, they can always go back to their breath to anchor them to the present moment. I also want to say that mindfulness 
has been used in a lot of different medical conditions and has been shown to be incredibly helpful with cardiac patients and cancer patients. It's been shown to help with depression that doesn't really respond to medication and patients who suffer from repeated episodes of depression. Because essentially what you're doing with mindfulness is you're training them to relate to their thoughts in a different way, to not take them as seriously and to watch them come and go and always go back to the present moment. So how would you integrate mindfulness into your practice? How could you use it with your patients? One thing that I use with my patients to help them with mindfulness is a five-minute, twice-a-day practice. And let me discuss the process for using this with your patients. First, what you want to do is provide some psychoeducation about what mindfulness is. Remember, mindfulness is getting back to the present moment and helping the patient realize that very rarely are we ever in the present moment. But to normalize that, no one really ever is. It's very difficult to be in the present moment, and our mind tends to want to go all over the place. It's hard to really be here. So in order to use this five-minute, twice-a-day practice, the process would be to take five minutes, twice a day, have the patient sit quietly in a comfortable place with their eyes closed, and just to start tuning into the present moment. And the way they do this is by focusing on their breath. They relax their muscles, and they focus on their breath in and out, the inhale and the exhale. And what you teach them is that if they have a thought, that they notice the thought, and then they let it go, and they redirect their attention back to their breath. So they'll breathe, and then they'll notice they'll, they're thinking again. So they don't judge it. They just redirect their attention back to their breathing. And then guess what? Your mind will start thinking. You redirect it back. And it's important to keep redirecting. It's very easy to get frustrated because everyone's brain wants to think. So what you're trying to do is to help your brain to be in the present moment through your breath. And they can just observe their mind going back and forth and just accept that it's a process and that's what it is. The key thing is to not judge and to continue to redirect back to the present moment. You can have them do that five minutes twice a day. In this next video clip, you're going to see how I tried using mindfulness with Michelle. I tried teaching her the five-minute twice-a-day practice. Remember, she's the 36-year-old mother who's hospitalized with MS. And during the first meeting, the social worker had sort of worked with Michelle to help her use affirmations. And now the social worker is coming back in to see how Michelle's doing. So here's Michelle. So Michelle, how are you doing? How's it going? I, I just... It's, it's, it's worse, you know, I just, I, I'm trying, I, I did what you told me, I've been reading it, mm -hmm. I just, I think it's, it's, it's overwhelming, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think it's, it's, I think it's not helping, you know, I, I did try doing so it. So you did try reading through it and it didn't really I did a couple help. of times during the day and it's, it's just, I don't know, I just, it's, I don't think it's, it's helping me. Yeah, yeah, how are you feeling now? Not good? No, I, I think it's worse, I think it's, it's. I think it's overwhelming, you okay. know, the feeling. And, and what, is it, what does it feel like in your body, like that kind of bad feeling, that sort of hopeless feeling it's, or it's, helpless? It's kind of like, like, I don't know, like some tension, some pressure in my chest, like somebody's uh -huh. like sitting on top of it. You okay. know, it's just like it's, so I don't know, like, right? yeah, it is. Okay. It's, and do you feel it right now? Yeah, I do. Okay. I, I don't think it's, um, I mean, it's been like that and it's not going away. Okay. Okay, so let's try something else. So the affirmations didn't work and that's fine. Let's try something else. Let's try something right now to kind of help you because I know that you're, you know, um, it's it's upsetting, the whole situation. And yeah. I know that you feel really bad right now. You know what? Let's try something. Um, have you ever heard, heard of something called mindfulness? Mm, no, no, not really. Mindfulness basically is about kind of being in the present moment. It's not sort of thinking about what happened in the past, and it's not worrying about what will happen in the future. It's about being right here, right now. Because most of us are not here right now. We're kind of thinking about what will happen in the future, and I wonder if that's what's going on right now, because you seem sort of anxious. Like if you're kind of worried about 
what's this going to mean and kind of so you're kind of getting you're into the future you're not here right now yes. so why don't we take a couple of minutes and try to be kind of right here right now and I'm wondering if we could just sort of sit for a couple minutes and sort of do this kind of mindfulness like exercise would that be okay yeah so okay and I'll, and I'll kind of show you how to do it so why don't you kind of you're you're kind of laying down so you're probably already comfortable why don't you kind of put your hands down and like close your eyes if that's more relaxing and what we're going to do right now is just sort of take a couple breaths just inhale and exhale and what I want you to do now is to just focus on breathing. Just focus on the sensations of inhaling and exhaling. Inhaling and exhaling. And if you think, if a thought comes to mind, I want you just to let it go. You don't have to think the thought. So let's just spend a couple minutes doing that. Now what I'd like you to do is to just sort of imagine taking your breath down to that area of your chest that was like really tight and almost like breathing into that a little bit. Breathing into the tension, again focusing on your breathing and your breath. If you have a thought, just let it go. And now, when you're ready, just sort of open your eyes. How are you feeling? I feel... I feel better. I feel relaxed. I, I have to be honest, I, I, I didn't really want to do it, but I think it feels better. I, mm -hmm. feel, I feel more relaxed. Do you still have that tightness in your chest? No, I, I, I don't. I, I think it, it went away. Mm -hmm. it actually Do you still helped. feel that really strong sense of helplessness? No. I think it, it, it helped. It, it went away. Okay. Well, do you see how thoughts and feelings sort of come and go? You, and body sensations come and go. So you had a tightness that was like five minutes ago, and you don't have it now, right? Yeah. And you had that feeling of being like helpless, and I'm so upset, and I feel really bad. And did it go away? Yeah, I did. Okay. I did so help. I just want you to kind of remember this, that the next time you feel really bad, I want you to remind yourself that just because I feel bad right now doesn't mean I'm going to feel bad in five minutes. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I do. That feelings come and go, thoughts come and go, body sensations come and go, and you don't have to attach to them. You can kind of let them go. And the reason we are focusing on your breath is because it kind of anchors you to the present moment, right? You weren't thinking about, you know, something that happened yesterday and you weren't worried about what's going to happen tomorrow. You were just right here, right now. And that's what mindfulness is. Okay. So maybe what we should do is just, I, I'd like for you to read a little bit more about mindfulness and maybe practice what we just did, like five minutes twice a day. Like use your timer from your phone and just, you know, Time, you know, record your, you know, set the timer for five minutes and do it twice a day. And, you know, we can just sort of notice what will happen. I think I, I gave you that patient handbook earlier. So, um, actually, here it is. Let me, let me mark the mindfulness section. Um, and then we'll kind of, you know, I'll come by tomorrow and see how it goes. But the one thing I want you to kind of keep in mind is it's not easy. It's sort of difficult. Your mind constantly is like this, chatter, 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 blah, 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 blah like that. So your mind is going to want to think, it's okay, don't judge it, just say, let it go, let the thoughts go, okay? okay, and redirect your attention back to your breath. Okay, and let's see if that kind of helps a little bit. And then I'll come back tomorrow and we'll see how you're doing, okay? Okay. So we just discussed, and you saw with Michelle, how I use the five-minute twice-a-day mindfulness intervention. Another option that you can do is basically the three-minute mindfulness intervention. And so I'd like to discuss how you can do that with your patients. The process, again, is psychoeducation about mindfulness and about bringing your mind back to the present moment. Again, normalizing 
that it's very, very difficult to do it, and we all struggle to be in the present moment, but that this exercise can help them train their brain to be in the present moment. The process is, for this specific intervention, is to have the patient close their eyes with their hands on their lap in a very relaxing place. And during the first minute, what you want them to do is to have them focus on the noises or the sounds that they hear. Again, if they have a thought, they just let the thought go and they redirect their attention back to the noises or the sounds they hear. And this will happen many, many times during that minute long time. During the second minute, you want to have them focus on their body sensations. Again, if they have a thought, they just notice the thought, let it go, redirect their attention back to their body. And again, they'll probably have to do that multiple times. The third minute, they focus on their breath, like they did in the last exercise. They're focusing on their inhale and their exhale. When they have a thought, they're noticing it, they're not judging it, and they're letting it go, redirecting their attention back on their breath. And again, with this exercise, like the last one, it's really critical that the patient understand that your mind doesn't want to be here. It wants to be in the the, the past. It wants to be in the future planning. So that's what all of our brains do, and it's natural. You just want to keep redirecting because, again, we're trying to train the brain to be here in the present moment. So, again, with Michelle, we're going to show you another case example with Michelle, the same mother, who is in the hospital with MS, and you're going to see how, you know, um, how this three-minute exercise, the mindfulness exercise, worked with her. So here's Michelle. So hi, Michelle. How are you doing? How are things going? I think it's going a little bit better. Um, I read what you gave me about, you know, what you've been trying to work on, and it's it's better, you know. I I do feel a little bit better, uh-huh. but you know what? I just couldn't do the five minutes. I I think it's it's too long for me, and I don't think I can focus for that long. You know, yeah. it's like I can't just concentrate for that long, yeah. and um, I I don't know if I'm just not able to do it. I'm not capable of doing it, or but it did work a little bit, but I just couldn't do it for the for five the minutes. full five minutes. No. So you like the mindfulness? Sort yes. Of sort of you find it relaxing and um, helpful yeah you know everyone finds it difficult it's not you okay it's not you at all it's very difficult like all of us sort of tend to be thinking about the past or thinking about the future so it's really hard to kind of be in the present moment that's definitely not you um, I find it very difficult and even though five minutes doesn't sound like a long time it's kind of a long time um, but You know, it's sort of, you have to keep in mind with this too, is that your brain's almost like a muscle that you have to exercise. Like, you know, if you go to the gym, Mm -hmm. you have to kind of build up to, you know, lifting a certain amount of weights. You can't just go in and lift 100 pounds. You got to gradually build up to it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like building a muscle. Yeah, I I used to work out, so I I know what you mean. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. So my point is be patient with the process that if you find it helpful to use the mindfulness and to be in the present moment, you just want to gradually kind of build up over time time, you know, okay. um, and that it's it's helpful. But you know what I was thinking what we could do, since the five minutes is a lot, there's another mindfulness exercise that a lot of people find really helpful. It's like a three-minute mindfulness exercise. Okay. Um, and why don't we do it here, because it's only three minutes, and you can kind of experience it yourself and kind of see what you think. Okay. So, um, so why don't we get into a position where you're, like, really comfortable? I mean, I know you're laying down. <laughs> I guess it's me being comfortable. And, um, you know, just sort of close your eyes if you find that relaxing. Okay. And we'll just take three minutes. And what I want us to do is that for the first minute, mm-hmm. I want you to just focus on the noises that you hear. Okay. Okay, any noises you hear, and if you have a thought, remember, just watch the thought go, come and go, and if you have a feeling, just let it come and go, and just refocus your attention back on the noises that you hear. Okay, so let's do that for one minute. Okay, now what I'd like you to do is for the next minute, I want you to just focus your attention on any body sensations that you notice. Just kind of go through, almost like scan your body for through um, for any sort of tension or anything that you notice in your body. And if you have a thought, just let it come and let it go. If you have a feeling, let it come and let it go. And refocus your attention on any body sensations that you notice. 
And let's do that for one minute as well. Okay, Michelle, for the last minute, what I'd like you to do is now I just want you to focus on your breath like we did last time. So just focus on your breathing, on the inhale and on the exhale. And again, if you have a thought, just let it come and let it go. Don't judge yourself for having the thought. Just notice it passing by and redirect your attention back on your breath. And let's do that for one minute. Okay, and then when you're ready, you can just open your eyes. How do you feel? I feel really relaxed. I, I think it, it felt like it was more than just three minutes. Isn't like, that amazing? Yeah, yeah. It, it, it felt like it was, it was longer than just uh -huh. the three minutes. Uh -huh. Isn't that interesting that three minutes can kind of completely transform? You know, you can feel completely different after only three minutes. Did you notice one was easier than the other? Yeah, I, I think the the first one, the one with the noise, was Focusing easier on the for noises. me. Yeah, you know, a lot of people find that. So, I mean, that's something you could do. You could instead of focusing on your breath, you could always focus on the noises you hear. And you, you know, we did that for one minute. And you know, if you're like me, even a minute was hard. So you can kind of just keep building up time. You know, go. You know, use more time than that. You know, um, did you notice anything with the when you were kind of scanning your body for tension, did you notice anything? I guess I didn't realize how much tension I have in my neck, mm -hmm. and um, I was able to feel it, and you know, like realizing yeah. that it was, it's there, and uh -huh. I guess it's I guess it's there all the time, it's just yeah. that I don't realize that it's there. Yeah, yes. yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Well, I want you to, I, where's that patient handbook again? Oh, he, I think, here it is. Um, actually, I'll give you another one. You know what? Here's what I want you to do. I'm going to write something down for you that I think you'll find interesting. Um, on YouTube, there's a really interesting body scan, and it's a 10-minute body scan, and it's like a guided mindfulness exercise. Okay. And I'd like you to check that out because I know you have your phone and, and your iPad. So I'm going to put it down, and I'd like you to do this body scan. Um, and then, again, continue reading the stuff on mindfulness, and you can you know, read more about mindfulness and you know, continue doing the, the exercises. Like okay. if you find listening to the noises is helpful, just gradually, incrementally increase the time, realizing that, you know, it takes time and you build up to it. Okay. But I'm glad you're doing better overall. Thank you. We discussed how you can use the five-minute mindfulness exercise and also the three-minute mindfulness exercise. But now I want to talk about something else, and that is how could you help a patient who to use mindfulness in an informal and day-to-day -day way. One thing to remember is, in order to be mindful, you don't need to sit and close your eyes and focus on your breath. Basically, at any point and at any time, any of us can choose to bring ourselves back to the present moment and to be mindful. You don't have to be focused on your breathing to do that. At any time, you can decide that you are gonna be right here, right now, present, in the activities that you're doing. And one way to help a patient do this is through the informal daily practice. So let me explain how you would do that. We already talked about the psychoeducation and the normalizing, which is the same as in the previous mindfulness uh, interventions that we discussed. The process with the informal daily practice is essentially to encourage the patient to take an ordinary day-to-day -day activity and to give it their full attention. So an example of that would be, let's say they're going to wash their hands. And this is something I used to do with my dialysis patients because before they get on the dialysis machine, they have to wash their hands. So what I would have them do is to go over to the sink and basically wash their hands, but not wash their hands in the way all of us do, which is sort of careless thinking about something else, but rather bringing your attention and your focus into the present moment. And the way you do that is by focusing on your senses. So while you're washing your hands, you're noticing what does the water feel like? What temperature is it? What does it feel like on your hands? As you're putting the soap on your hands, you're smelling the soap. What does the soap smell like? What does it feel like on your hands? What do you notice when the water is coming out of the spout? What does it sound like? What does it look like? What do your hands look like when they're covered in soap? So you're basically integrating all of your senses to come back to the present moment. 
And washing your hands is a good way to do it. Eating is a good way to do it. Walking. Any time you want to come back to the present moment, the way you do it is through your senses. So that is another opportunity that patients have to basically practice mindfulness and become mindful of the present moment. And remember, the beauty of mindfulness is that any time you bring yourself back to the present moment, guess what? You're not ruminating, right? You're not thinking about how bad your life is. You're not worrying about how many problems you're going to have in the future or how you're never going to feel better. You're not remembering all the bad things that happened to you. So you really cut down the angle on suffering. And that's what it's about. Because again, with depression, a big part of the problem are these thoughts. These thoughts about how nobody likes me, what a horrible life I have. These thoughts about this is never going to get better, I'm never going to feel better, right? Because think about that. They're not in the present moment when they're having these kind of anxious thoughts about the future and ruminative thoughts about the past usually, right? So by bringing it back to the present moment, you're not thinking at all. There is no thought. Your thoughts are completely focused on being in the present moment. Remember, because when you have a thought, you're letting it go. You're not attaching to it. And by doing that, you take the meaning out of the thought. You don't have to engage with the thought. So you create the space and the distance from the thought, which again, cuts down the angle on suffering. And that is the point of mindfulness. I now want to discuss some clinical complications with you because sometimes there are clinical complications, and one of them is that the intervention didn't work. The social worker and the patient might have worked together and they may have tried an intervention, but it didn't work. And remember that STI often requires multiple interventions. So let's talk about some possible reasons why the intervention didn't work. I want you to consider and to ask yourself these questions if that intervention didn't work. Was the intervention too complicated or too big? And could it be altered? Sometimes we basically bite off more than we can chew, and it, by simply making a few alterations, it will work. Another thing to consider is maybe try a different intervention, meaning imagine you, took, you tried a behavioral intervention with a patient, maybe you could try a cognitive intervention. Or maybe the cognitive intervention didn't work, you could try a mindfulness intervention. So you could try a different type of intervention. It's really critical though, regardless of what happened or why, it's really important to normalize that it often takes multiple interventions to help the patient feel better and to express confidence that together you can come up with an intervention that will work. This next video really illustrates how multiple interventions are used. And with Sue, remember she's the 55-year-old with cancer who's back on chemo, and she's really been struggling with rumination. And really, it takes, I think, three interventions for Sue to start getting better. But I want you to notice during this video that the message I tell Sue that it's okay, we're going to figure it out, don't worry about it, just because it didn't work doesn't mean something else won't work, and expressing that confidence and helping Sue feel better. So here's Sue. Hi, Sue. Were you able to try that stop technique? Less. I did. I tried it, but, you know, it worked for a little while, but I just got frustrated after a while, and I went right back to not being able to sleep. Okay. So you know what, I have another idea. Why don't we have you, before you go to bed at night, why don't we have you write down some of your thoughts about the cancer? Because I'm wondering if some of your thoughts about the cancer are distorted, like not based on mm -hmm. facts. And I wonder if that's what's sort of you know going on, but I don't know. So I wonder if you could take this and maybe just do a little journaling or writing out some of your thoughts on the cancer before you go to bed at night. Okay. You know, maybe like 15 minutes before, and then bring it in. I know you're coming in next week. Mm -hmm. Bring it in next week, and then we'll go through it together, and we'll look at sort of some of the evidence for some of your thoughts. Okay. You know, okay. And we'll try that. All right. And if it doesn't work, we'll find something that'll, that'll help you sleep better. All right. Thanks. I really appreciate you helping me like this. Sure. 
So, Sue, how did it work out, writing down your thoughts? About oh, my gosh, it was such a disaster. I mean, I know you don't know this about me, but I'm a perfectionist. And I spent two hours on that stupid thing <sighs> just obsessing over it. It, okay. it did not work for me. Okay. It's not going to oh, no. work. Oh, no. Okay. I'm really sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, let's, let's, let's try something else. You know, the other thing I had in mind is uh, what if we did some visualization? When you go to bed at night and you're laying down, what if we sort of had you do like some positive imagery or visualization work where you actually kind of think about being in a really kind of pleasant, nice place? You know, like, do you like going to the beach? Yeah, I love the beach. Okay. So what if it, you're laying down, you're going to sleep, and you start visualizing that you're on vacation, you're in Hawaii, you're sort of on the beach, and you're sort of using all your senses. You're sort of imagining what it smells like, what it feels like, you know, the sun on your back, and and just all the sensations, what you're seeing. What about that? And just sort of really, because that actually is very relaxing for most people. And I wonder if that would help you to relax enough to kind of drift off into yeah. sleep. Okay. I mean, I'll try it. At this point, I will try anything. Okay. I know, I know it's so frustrating not to be able to go to sleep. I really, we are going to help you with this. We're going to figure this out. So again, here's some stuff on visualization that's in the this patient handbook. I want you to read about it and remember to incorporate as many of your senses as you can. And try that tonight and we'll see how that works. Okay. So, Sue, were you able to fall asleep using the visualization? No, I just, I could not get into it. You know, I just couldn't imagine myself on a beach, and it just didn't work for me. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, you know what? Visualization doesn't work for everybody, so it's not a big deal. But, you know, it's funny, because I was thinking, what if the visualization doesn't work? What are we going to do? And I think what might really help you is... Um, something called a mindfulness exercise. Have you ever heard of mindfulness? No, what's that? What is it? Well, mindfulness is basically about being in the present moment, not sort of being in the past mm -hmm. and not being in the future. And have you ever noticed when you're thinking that a lot of times you're thinking about something that happened or you're sort of planning or anticipate something that's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Like very few people are right here, right now. You know, so... Um, Remember we talked about how before sometimes you think about the cancer and you worry about your kids? That's anxiety because you're sort of going to the future and imagining what's going to happen. So you're not really in the present moment. You're sort of off in the future somewhere. Mm -hmm. So what if we were to do something where when you go to bed at night, you're really kind of in the present moment. You're just right here, right now. And the way you can do that is we, I can teach you this sort of exercise, and, and I'll have you read about it, where you basically, when you go to bed and you lay down and you're going to sleep, you just focus on your breath. The inhale, the exhale. And what happens is, is your brain wants to think. Mm -hmm. All of our brains want to think. It's chatter, constant chatter. The average person has like 60,000 thoughts a day. So our mm -hmm. brain's constantly working. So you're going to start thinking. But instead of kind of thinking the thought and engaging the thought, I want you just to watch the thought come and go and just focus your attention back to your breathing. So you're breathing. You'll start thinking about the cancer and just, you know, let the thought come, let it go. And for me, what I do at night if I have insomnia, I sort of imagine my thought as like one of my children coming in and saying, you know, Mommy, let's go to the park. And I would say, no, honey, it's time to go to bed. It's not time to go to the park. So uh, what if you were to visualize your thought as sort of kind of coming in at the wrong time? And you were to say, no, it's not time to think, it's time to sleep, and just refocus your attention back on your breathing. Mm -hmm. Don't get angry at yourself for thinking, because that's, again, what your brain does. It just wants to think. So just, no, it's almost like gently taking your child back to bed. The child comes back, no, we're going to bed. The child, do you see? It's the same thing with your brain and you redirect your attention back on your breath and on your, you know, the inhale and the exhale. And it just helps you to be in the present moment. 
Okay. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. I'll try that. Sure. Yeah, it is. It's very interesting, and it actually uh, works a lot. It works with me sometimes when I wake up in the middle of the night. So, and again, mindfulness is is something I'd like you to read about. Okay. And um, and why don't you try that tonight? And again, if this doesn't work, we will figure something out. We'll get you to sleep. Okay. Thanks. Hi, Sue. Hi. You look amazing. Oh, I know. How are you doing? Look at me. I'm smiling again. I can't believe it. It worked. You know, it was just like you said. It took probably four or five times of me ignoring the thought and then focusing on my breathing, but I was, I was able to fall asleep. Wow. That's so cool. You it must is. feel so much better. I do. I, I just can't believe that something so simple could work. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? Uh-huh. It really is. Yeah. yeah. And how do you feel in other areas of your life? Now that you're well, sleeping better. Well, of course, sleep affects everything, and I feel less fatigued. Uh -huh. I feel less depressed, mm -hmm. um, and I just have a lot more energy. Yeah. And I'm really I'm proud of myself because I was able to conquer that. Yeah. It was such a big thing. I know, I know, and you really worked hard. And look at you. You're, like, wearing your makeup, and you're chatty, and you're animated, and it's so good to see you back to yourself again. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so I'm, I'm glad that this worked out. And, you know, I'm around so that, you know, We'll keep in touch, and when you need okay. me again, you you know, let me know. All right, sounds good. Another clinical complication is one session STI. Remember that a lot of times it is only going to be possible to see your patient once, especially if you work in a hospital setting. Frequently in hospital settings, you might see the patient one time, and I want you to still consider using these STI interventions because they're very beneficial and they're very helpful even if you only meet with the patient once. So if you can only meet with your patients one time, I want you to consider the following. Here are some steps to take. It's very important that you provide the psychoeducation about the thought-mood-behavior connection using that cognitive triangle. Also, you might consider teaching the patient two interventions instead of just one because that would allow them to experiment on their own. I still think it's valuable to assign homework to these patients and to give them something to do. And I would also provide the STI patient handbook so that the patient can read through on their own and do some of the work at home on their own. You also might consider a creative way for follow-up. The patient might be amenable to outpatient therapy, or there might be a way that you could have a phone session with them. So consider a creative way to follow up. So Margaret, thank you so much for coming in. I know that you've been going through a difficult time, and the doctor wanted me to talk to you because he's really worried about you. You know, and yeah. that's been hard. Can you tell me a little bit yeah. about what's been going on? Well, you know, my son Michael has been diagnosed with cancer, and um, it's been very hard. I, I can't stop worrying about him. Yeah, I can only imagine I if that's hard. I can't sleep and I'm having a hard time just coping and keeping my job. Yeah, up. of course. Yeah, I can't imagine what you're going through. Of course, that's mess. difficult. Yeah, I know. I can't even imagine. How difficult it must be. Yeah. How's he doing? Um, well, they're telling me that he's doing better. I mean, the prognosis is, you know, hopeful, but I, I, I just don't believe them. I, you know, it's so hard to see him every day like that. Yeah, and sure. I, I just can't stop. I can't stop. You can't stop, like, worrying? Yeah, I can't right. stop. You know. so, so even though the doctor said he's doing better, you're still finding that you're having a difficult time worrying, right? That you keep yes, worrying, yes. even though the doctor's saying he's okay, yeah. he's going to be all right, you're noticing that you still are worrying about him. Is that right? Yes, very much. Is that is that something you want me to help you with? Like, Yeah, yes. With, with this could. kind of worry? I just don't know what to do. I... I I don't know what to do anymore. Sure. No, I understand. It's a really difficult time. So again, what you're noticing is that you're worrying about your son, even though the doctor's saying it's okay, his prognosis is good. Yeah. And then when you start worrying about it, you get really upset, right? Yes. 
Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your thoughts, like when you notice that you're, you know, sort of getting upset and thinking about it? Tell me about your thoughts. Well, um, I just, I just start thinking about his, you know, what hap what happens if he doesn't make it, and mm -hmm. I don't know if I can get through that, and. So you start kind of going down a bad path, yes. right? Yeah. So really you kind of go to catastrophe, and, catastrophe yeah, situations, like, like, right? You know, yes. Yeah, like what would happen? Okay. When you notice yourself thinking those thoughts, you get upset, right? Yes. Okay. And I just want to tell you briefly, there, the way someone thinks about something is really connected to how they feel. So when you start thinking about this, even though it sounds like it's not necessarily true, it gets you really upset, right? Yes. Right. And then what do you do? What is your behavior that you do? I just, I can't do anything. I just cry and cry and cry. And okay. Right. You get yourself. I try to like pull myself together and, you know, that lasts for like five minutes. And right. I so just you get can't. like really worked up, yes. right? Okay. Well, I just want to explain something really quick to you that I want you to really consider when you go home. Okay. And, and it is this idea that what you think, your thoughts, your thoughts and your <laughs> affects how you feel, right, your feelings, and it affects how you behave, okay, so your actions, so, or behaviors. So basically what happens, and I want to point this out to you, is your thought is, it sounds like what you're telling yourself is, Michael's going to die, like if I had to, right? So you're telling yourself, Michael's going to die, and then you feel, understandably, really upset yes. and really sad, right? And then... And then it affects you because then you probably kind of pull away and you cry and you get really sad, yep. right? Okay. So this is kind of, you kind of pull away and you, and it sounds like you ruminate and you spend a lot of time yeah, thinking about it's this. Like I just, I'm like a, a hamster, you know, I can't. Yeah, I can't stop thinking. Okay. So here's, and you want to work together. So I have a couple different ideas for you and I want to kind of throw some out because I know that how this hospital works, I might not see you again. So I want to try give you a couple different ways that you could approach this. Okay. 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 So basically, because the way you think is connected with how you feel and what you do, we could work on it a couple different ways. We could help you change the way you're thinking. And the reason I say that is because you're telling yourself Michael's going to die, even though it sounds like there's not a lot of evidence for that fact, right? Yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, He's going to do okay. They're telling me good things. Okay. You know? So could you do this? When you notice that you're saying to yourself, Michael's going to die, is there any way you could, we could write it down, Michael is actually doing well. How do you feel about <laughs> when you, what would that be That's like? That's just a relief to what if see you it. actually? What if you actually, when you found yourself getting worked up and you found yourself really getting sad, what if you actually were to tell yourself this and to remind yourself this? What would that be like? Oh, um, it I would mean, be it would be very relieving. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I could believe, believe it. it. Right, I understand, and and part of that is because it sounds like what's happened is you've kind of told yourself this story for a while that that's kind of naturally where yeah. your brain goes. Yeah. So I'm wondering, yeah, this is not going to feel natural right away. Okay. I actually think it would be very helpful for you to write this down and to okay. carry it around with you and to remind yourself of this many times a day. Yeah, I carry a picture of him with me every yeah. day and I have and to maybe, go to work and stuff. So Right. So Michael's actually doing really well. Yeah. And you can put, you know, he's getting good grades, he's doing better, his hair's growing, and to actually kind of remind yourself of that like many times a day. Okay. The other thing you might do is when you find yourself, like I'm wondering too, is if when you find yourself feeling really sad, if you're actually thinking that thought and you're not aware that you're thinking it. Because people think all the time, and a lot of their thoughts are unconscious. So I wonder if you, when you start getting sad and upset, if you're actually not realizing it, but you're telling yourself, Michael's going to die, Michael's going to die, and that it actually, when you start feeling sad, it might help you to kind of read through yeah. this again. You know what I mean? Because we want to cut down the angle. Yeah. It sounds like when you start thinking that thought, you're going down like a bad path. You're yeah, going it's... down a road where you're upset and you're sad. 
So I think we should cut down that angle. Okay. The other, so I want you to do that. Okay, the I can do that. The other thing I want you to do is I want you, I think we should work on some of these behaviors that you're doing. I wonder if, well, let me ask you, are you, do you find yourself um, not doing as many activities as you used to do? Well, you know, I mean, since he's um, just come home from the hospital, you know, it's still really dealing with that and, and seeing him just right. so tired and everything. So I, I feel incredibly guilty. I don't want to do anything. Um, right. I, do, I don't even want to go to the grocery store because I'm afraid that something's going to happen to him while I'm gone. Right. Which, which is understandable, yeah. but you're married, right? You have a yeah. husband and yeah. your husband's home. And yes. don't you have other children to take care yeah. of? Okay, so some of this too, I want you to realize is to help you, but it's to help Michael and to help the other kids as well. Because as you and I both know, when you're a mother, if mom's not doing well, then no one's doing well, yes. right? And so some of this is we have to kind of help you so that you can also take care of Michael, but also take care of the other kids. Because my worry for you is that if you really are struggling with this, which is completely understandable, but if you're struggling with this, I wonder if it's harder for you to kind of take care of the other kids and to take care of Michael, right? Yes. So what could you do when you notice that you have a lot of dead time and you're thinking a lot and you ruminate? What could you do that would be good for you to just not think as much? or to something nice for you so that we're not sitting around thinking all the time because remember these are all yeah. interconnected. Well, my... And to take care of yourself as well. Uh, what could you do? Well, my my, my uh, kids are making fun of me because I have a beautiful garden and it's all, mm -hmm. you know, a mess. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. it would so be you nice could go out and garden. garden. Yeah. That would be fantastic. Yeah. I, what if you did that? I mean, what if you gardened a little more? Again, just to cut down on the angle, I really don't want you sitting around the house not doing anything, ruminating about this. Yes. Because remember, what you're telling yourself is not actually true, it sounds like, based on what the doctors well, are saying. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's certainly scary. Anytime has can't, you know, there, yeah. there's an element I of just sort of... I can't, you know, I haven't let go of it, I think, because of going through all of it with right, the chemo and, right. you know, it was so scary in Yeah, absolutely. And, Absolutely. It's been a very hard adjustment. To kind of let it go. Yeah. So here's a question. When do you, you know, you don't have to answer this now, but I want you to think about it, is when you'd be ready to let it go. When would you be ready to consider that he's actually going to heal from this? And that what can you do to kind of help this healing process? When would you be able to well, sort of... Well, I, I have to... I have to start doing something now. Because okay. Because I, you know... It's he, not working out. No. It's okay. really bad negatively affecting everybody right. and okay you know it's affecting my job and okay right my health and, right exactly you know, my other kids like, and my absolutely, husband absolutely absolutely you sitting around telling yourself this story is not helping you right so i think what we should do is i want you to read these cards okay. and i also want you to do more of the gardening I think the okay. gardening, if you find that healing and good for you, you should do that. And maybe consider doing other things that are good for you so that we're not sitting around ruminating and thinking too much. Like, okay. we actually want to get you out busy and in yeah. the world. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because you're a mom and you have, what, three kids? Mm -hmm. you're, and you're working. So you're probably normally very busy. We want to cut down that angle when you're sort of in your head thinking about this. Okay. Do you want to try those? Yeah. And I'll, I'll also give you this workbook, this handbook I want you to kind of look through. Okay. You know? Yeah, I'll, okay? I'll try it. Absolutely. Okay. I'm, I really am tired of I know. This, You've you know, been through a I'm rough time. I'm tired. But you know what? You're doing really well. Yeah. And that's the other thing that might be helpful in addition to Michael's doing well, is to really tell yourself that you're really strong. You've yeah. been able to pull he through this. He is too, you know. He is he's too. He's been through a lot. He's, he is, but you are as well. Because when you're the mom, you have to kind of keep it together for everyone else. So another thing that actually might be really helpful is for you to say, you know what? I'm, I'm actually really a strong woman. Like, I'm strong. <laughs> Okay. And I'm going to get through this, right? Yes. Like, that would help you. <laughs> I will try to believe that right now. Okay. I know it's hard to, <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. But some of this is, if but, you yeah. read it and you think it, it actually, believe it or not, it, I think it actually will help you change what you're telling yourself. Okay. So why don't you try those I will, things? I will, I will. Okay. And I will get into my garden. Okay, good. Thank you Thank so you so much. much for coming in. Thank, Thank you. you.
Let's say that you work with a patient and they're much better. The symptom has resolved and they're feeling much better. But now they're worried that they're going to get depressed again. What are some things that you can do to help the patient prevent from getting depressed again? Almost like relapse prevention. There are three things that I think are very important that you could do. Um, the first thing is to help the patient to create a daily self-care routine. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. The second thing is to continue teaching the patient some psychoeducation and psychoemotional concepts that we'll be talking about in a couple minutes as well. And you can also give the patient the STI patient handbook, and they can read through and be able to sort of follow up, read some of the psychoeducation materials, and try some of the interventions at home if they do start to feel bad. So let's talk about the daily self-care routine. The reason this is so important for everyone, not just for patients, but for everyone, is because it basically prevents problems, future problems, and it helps maintain psychological equilibrium. It decreases stress and depression and anxiety, and it helps patients to recognize the need for self-care, and it helps in creating a daily self-care routine. So here are the things I want you to do to help your patient come up with a self-care routine. Here's some patients, or questions you can ask your patient. You can ask your patient, what are you doing to take care of yourself on a daily basis? Emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And what would stop you from honoring those physical, emotional, and spiritual needs? And how can you problem solve that? There are a couple different components to daily self-care, which I touched on a little bit. One is diet, making sure the patient's eating regularly and the right types of food. Another one is exercise, which can help with depression and anxiety. And the other is sort of a healthy sleep-wake cycle, so getting adequate rest and sleep and the maintenance of relationships. So these are all things that you can discuss with the patient, again, to prevent future relapses and problems. There are some psycho-emotional concepts that I think are so critical that I want to discuss them briefly. And these are key concepts for all patients, regardless of what symptom you are working on with them. And you might consider writing them down on cards for patients, or alternatively, you can give them the STI patient handbook, which has all of these concepts in there. And I think that these concepts could actually help patients to prevent future problems if they kind of remind themselves of these concepts. So here are the concepts, these critical concepts. Thoughts, feelings, and behaviors are all interconnected. Thoughts are not facts. Feelings are not facts. Difficult feelings are uncomfortable, but they won't kill you. Emotions don't necessarily mean anything. And thoughts and feelings come and go. I'd like to discuss briefly the emotions don't necessarily mean anything because we didn't really talk about that in the video and I just want to discuss that very briefly. And what I mean by that is sometimes when a patient gets sad, they think that it means they're going to get depressed. Or if they get angry, it means they're an angry person. Or if they feel scared, it means they're going to be anxious. Feelings don't have to mean anything. It could just mean that you're having a moment of sadness and you let it go. So they don't necessarily have to mean anything. And I want to point that out so that the patients can understand that and they can kind of let these feelings kind of go. I want to thank you so much for taking the time to learn STI for your patients because I really feel that it's going to help you in your clinical practice and it's really going to help your patients. And in closing, I want to say something really important, and that is there are a lot of interventions to learn with STI, and there are a lot of concepts that take time to kind of think about and process. And what I would encourage all of you to do is to think of yourself as your first patient to really start with the cognitive triangle and to start to observe how your thoughts affect your moods, which affect your behaviors, and how they're all interconnected. And then to start trying some of these interventions on yourself 
to try some of the mindfulness, to try some of the cognitive techniques, to try a little of the behavioral activation, definitely to implement a self-care, a daily self-care routine. I really want you to try that because when you start practicing these concepts and these ideas as your own patient, it's easier. They become easier and you start becoming more confident using them and you can take them to your patients and you start really understanding them in a deep way. So I would encourage you to do that. The other thing I want to encourage you to do is to go to my website, which is www sti-innovations, two i's and two n's, dot com. And you can also email me at melissa at sti-innovations.com. I love hearing about cases. I love communicating with clinicians and social workers and hearing how you're using STI. And on the website, if you go to the website, you can see cases. You can see all the different products, the training manuals there, as well as the patient handbooks. You can read all the articles that have been written about STI. So again, thank you very much.